done, but uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, particularly to Miles, who is here from Sydney. I'm sure there are others, maybe. Um, my name is Benedict. I'm going to talk to you today about work that I and some colleagues have been doing and will be doing on transactions in Apache Cassandra. Um, the talk's going to be and split into roughly two sections. Uh, initially, I'm going to talk about work that we have already undertaken to improve the performance of transactions in Cassandra as they stand today. And then I'm going to talk about uh, what we propose to do to bring state-of-the-art transactions to Cassandra over the coming year. Um, and by state-of-the-art, I mean uh, transactions with properties that exceed those of uh, any other industry database and some very important uh, qualities that we'll discuss later. <clears throat> so we'll start by very briefly discussing what lightweight transactions are. Lightweight uh, is essentially a, uh, a nice way of saying limited. Uh, these transactions are uh, otherwise often referred to as compare and set operations. They allow you to atomically modify the data within a single partition key in the database um, by inserting new data or um, updating the data that's there if some condition is met that's arbitrary that's specified by the user. Obviously, these are quite uh, limited, but um, much like and set on your CPU, you can build most distributed uh, state machines that you might like to build just with a lot of effort. Uh, so <clears throat> lightweight transactions uh, came to Cassandra quite a while back um, before Raft became popular or it was even published, in fact. And so uh, lightweight transactions are built atop of Paxos. So we're going to briefly talk about how Paxos works, at least in theory, initially. So Paxos has three phases, roughly speaking. Uh, the initial phase, which we call the prepare round, uh, states a coordinator's intention to perform some kind of action and seeks promises from replicas that, that it will be able to undertake that action. If a majority accepts that, uh, that state's intention to act and promise to, to act on it, uh, then the coordinator will, in the second round, in the proposed round, it will state that that action has been undertaken on the condition that no newer intention to act or promise has been uh, declared by another coordinator. Now, if a majority uh, acknowledge that this is the case, then at that point, the transaction is considered to have been decided and applied, logically at least, and the result can be acknowledged to the client immediately. And asynchronously, the actual result of that transaction can be recorded to the database. So in Cassandra, it looks a little bit different. Uh, you'll see that there's this additional uh, step. We, we start with the same stating of intention to act, the prepare round. We then read the current state of the database, and this is because we obviously uh, have a condition uh, that we want to um, determine the uh, execution's um, behavior upon. Uh, and once, that, once we've performed the read, we can decide whether or not the write is going to be applied. And then we propose that the action is undertaken on the condition that no newer promises or intentions to act have been declared. And then finally, we have this other slight uh, switcheroo, which is that we synchronously commit the data to the database durably before then acknowledging to the client. So you can see we've got this additional read round, which uh, is there for reasonably obvious reasons. And then this additional commit step, which is perhaps less obvious uh, the reason for it. And that, the, the, the rationale here is that um, the, the uh, transaction state data inside for performing uh, lightweight transactions is recorded in a system table that is TTL'd. And so if for some reason the uh, transaction isn't completed, uh, isn't committed durably to the to the base table after being acknowledged to the client, and the TTLs expire, then the state of the database would not be consistent with the uh, answer that the client had received. So <clears throat> what can we do to make these uh, faster? Well, the uh, initial thing we can do is quite straightforward, and I think many of you might have uh, assumed this could be possible. And that is that we can merge these initial two rounds. Logically speaking, there's no difference between performing the uh, or obtaining the promise and recording the intention to act, and then performing the read and responding with the uh, answer to both of these uh, of, uh, at the same time. And that leaves us with the slightly trickier uh, prospect of um, removing the uh, TTLs from System Paxos so that we can ensure that the transaction state um, is valid until uh, the transaction is completed. So this involves a heavily simplified uh, form. Uh, every replica that witnesses a transaction 
as a participant or any any, any other way uh, records uh, uh, records to a set of uncommitted transactions those transactions that have been witnessed as in progress but not complete when uh, it does witness a commit it then records that as no longer in flight for for itself at least what this allows to happen is that if this coordinator a uh, happens to fail before the commit step is completed then at least one of the other two uh, replicas is able to complete then take over where the uh, original coordinator left off and complete the transaction um, this is combined with a kind of distributed repair mechanism that coordinates this on mass to ensure that all transactions prior to a certain point in time have been completed or invalidated if they were um, not at a point at which they would have um, uh, been acknowledged to a client and altogether that allows us to remove this additional uh, phase of the of the protocol for for us and, and Cassandra can we go any further though well um, the eagle eye democracy might have recognized that uh, for a read the stated intention to act is is essentially a not you're not actually intending to do anything um, this proposed step can be necessary when racing with a right to ensure linearizability but in many cases this uh, promise uh, can be obtained, the read can be performed, and if the promise is still valid at the end of uh, that operation and the replica can respond stating that was the case, then if the coordinator sees that for all replicas, this no-op doesn't need to be undertaken because the, the read was consistent throughout all of its, uh, throughout every replica's um, performing of the read. And we can now take down to just a single phase for, for reads that are not contended and straightforward. Um, very briefly, this work encompasses some other uh, uh, performance improvements. I won't go into too much detail, uh, but uh, we prevent competition between commutative operations. Specifically, reads don't need to invalidate other reads. They can, they can uh, uh, happily happen concurrently. And a bunch of other very specific and technical niche improvements to recovery, which is much too detailed to go into in this talk. And so this is where we were before. This is the kind of a summary of, of, of this work. This is where we fought with four wide area round trips. Um, I should briefly discuss why we care about this, uh, and that is that um, the performance of these protocols in a, uh, in a global uh, network setting where you have multiple regions is pretty much decided by the number of phases you have here. And so here we're looking at four times having to go over the network, which could be very expensive in a uh, fully geo-distributed database. Um, and now we go down to two wide area round trips in the case of writes and one wide area round trip in the case of reads. Now, I'm sure everyone here is aware of how famous and challenging it is to uh, modify distributed transactions or distributed consensus protocols uh, and do so correctly. And so we have invested probably almost as much time in validating this work as we have in implementing it. Uh, both have been quite significant undertakings. And uh, I'm going to give a brief speak, talk about this briefly, but we've introduced a, an imaginatively named simulator uh, capability that um, is able to deterministically uh, run an entire uh, cluster's behavior within a single JVM. Um, that is, uh, every time you run a, uh, a workload against this cluster, it will perform the exact same behaviors, and it will also do so pseudo-randomly. So um, adversarially, uh, the, sorry, the um, behaviors of the cluster are, are executed adversarially. So every single thread event, message, uh, synchronized block, every monitor access, every um, message being sent, every writing to a streaming connection, and a range of other things, including um, annotated uh, volatile uh, properties, um, are uh, intercepted and scheduled uh, in, in a random manner compared to other threads, but pseudo-randomly so that it's deterministic. Um, this has been combined with a uh, a dedicated linearizability uh, verification process that uh, validates the external uh, validity of the of any API calls by clients that they are linearizable, um, but also uh, performs because we have access to the whole cluster performs quite invasive state checks at important points to validate that the internal state of the database um, is consistent with prior states in the database and that that there's been no possibility of linearizability violations introduced that maybe wouldn't be witnessed by a client, but could still turn into those. And so we can detect them earlier. Um, and this has been used to simulate hundreds of thousands of clusters and 
uh, tens of billions of transactions uh, to prove the safety of this of this protocol. Um, after ad adequately convincing ourselves that it was uh, it was safe, we have uh, deployed this into production and it's been running uh, for some time now and has accrued um, more than well, roughly one and a half trillion uh, read-only transactions and a quarter of a trillion write transactions. Um, and these have been run with uh, additional uh, verification uh, as well, uh, not as sophisticated or as, as complete as the, uh, the, the simulated verification, but still able to detect a wide range of linearizability violations without uh, doing so. Uh, and this work uh, is uh, coming to Trunk soon. Uh, if you're interested in it, uh, you're welcome to follow along on the dev list uh, CEP14 discussions or on JIRA. Um, and we hope to post a patch uh, in the coming couple of weeks, I hope. So <clears throat> why stop there? Can we make them even faster? Well, I discussed that uh, obviously today Raft is a very uh, popular protocol. Um, but the uh, comparable protocol in the Paxos family, which actually was originally meant to be called Paxos, I think, by Lam Leslie Lamport, um, is multi-Paxos. Um, and that's essentially is uh, where you have a stable leader, where a single uh, replica coordinates all of the transactions um, for the time that it holds the leader at least. And that allows you to remove this initial round for writes. Note that we're already down to one round for reads, but also to remove some contention issues. So it seems like a, a straightforward thing that we should pursue. Um, but we're going to discuss some downsides and some reasons why we might want to go a different route. So the initial one that always comes up in the literature is that uh, le a leader-based approach cannot ever achieve optimal global performance or optimal global latency. Any client in a different region to the leader is going to have to take uh, two round trips to answer any of its operations. It can't ever be one round trip. So uh, potentially, you are uh, going to be costlier even for reads uh, than, than, than the, the present day approach. Additionally, there are a range of other more minor problems, including uh, the obvious one of, of service interruption during failover. This is, generally speaking, considered to be acceptable. Um, but we are still talking about several seconds of total outage for uh, that uh, uh, partition, potentially. Um, but this is manageable for most people. And there are a range of other potentially minor issues. But the big reason I uh, consider a leader-based approach to be a poor choice for Cassandra and distributed databases is that they make general purpose transactions particularly hard. And so this brings us on uh, neatly to the second half of the talk in which I'm going to show you briefly how to make a state-of-the-art uh, general purpose distributed transaction system. So first off, what do we mean by a distributed, sorry, a general purpose transaction? So I'm going to talk about it very uh, loosely and weakly and say that we mean uh, a, a transaction that can operate over any keys in the database uh, simultaneously, so without any restriction of any kind, so obviously not limited to a single partition key. And um, the cano canonical example is Alice sending Bob $100. And in this example, it's further complicated by the fact that Alice, uh, Alice's account lives not only on different machines to Bob's, but multiple machines, all of which are replicated to different regions. Additionally, we need these operations, at the very least, to be uh, conditional on data from any of these keys. Um, we need to atomically, you know, with ACID properties, be able to debit money from Alice's account and, and credit it to Bob's account only if Alice's account has $100 in it. Otherwise, you know, if, if Bob's account gets $100 and Alice's doesn't debit it, we're going to be in a mess. <clears throat> so now that we've defined loosely what we're talking about, um, I'm going to discuss the two main broadly speaking, industry approaches to distributed transactions using a stable leader. Uh, the initial uh, approach, uh, and the, the most straightforward one, uh, although far from trivial, um, is the, the one taken, broadly speaking, by FaunaDB and FoundationDB. They both implement this very differently, so um, please don't consider them to be equivalent databases at all. But they, they essentially use a single process to linearize the transactions to decide what order transactions will be evaluated in. The problem with this, of course, is that you've just 
created a fan out of, of sorts, you're, you're still going to eventually hit a cluster size beyond which this leader can't make decisions for the whole cluster. And so you're going to have to shard your cluster. Um, and we have very large uh, Cassandra clusters in the wild today. And as a result, this seems like a, a no starter for Cassandra. So that leaves the other category of approach. Uh, and these essentially, as far as I can tell, are all spanner derivatives. Uh, this includes, uh, from the best of my knowledge, uh, DynamoDB and certainly CockroachDB and, and Yugabyte. Um, now, these databases all accept certain caveats that I consider to be suboptimal. Uh, they specifically, most, most importantly, only offer serializable isolation uh, guarantees. This means that your queries can time travel. And by that, I mean that you can have a situation where a client writes a result, uh, writes a key to the database or a record to the database. And uh, another client, or potentially in some cases the same client, it depends on the semantics of the system in question, is able to perform a read against that same data record and not witness it, uh, even though it's performed it after the write was acknowledged. Um, it's possible for the, for the query to be performed as though it happened before the write. Um, and this is a very surprising behavior, I think, uh, to a lot of clients. And depending on the application, uh, something that can be hard to know if your application behaves correctly in the face of. Um, some of these databases, at least, I don't know that they all do. I think actually it might only be CockroachDB that does this, uh, uh, guarantees strict serializable isolation if you can guarantee your clocks are synchronized. Unfortunately, that's a very hard problem. This is essentially the same problem that Spanner uh, adopts. In the case of Spanner, there is a great deal of uh, capital and uh, uh, operating expense invested in trying to provide realistic physical guarantees that this will be maintained. But these are outside of the, um, the remit of most uh, de people deploying databases. Additionally, uh, these protocols involve, all of them as far as I can tell, optimistic concurrency control, which means that uh, aborts become a problem as your transaction sizes increase, which is, this is not a disabling problem, but it, it, it would be preferable if these decisions were left to the operator to decide what uh, size and complexity of transaction is, is optimal. Just gonna check this, nothing going wrong here? Yeah, okay. I assume you can all hear me and everything's going smoothly. <clears throat> um, finally, uh, the, uh, the, these, pro the, these, these, uh, these approaches all have a similar problem to the one we discussed with clients being in different regions, but it's exacerbated further by leaders potentially being in different regions. So um, there are strategies to try and place leaders for records that are likely to be accessed together in the same region. These can be either automatic, which leads to surprising uh, performance behaviors when the automatic placement mechanisms get the decision wrong, um, or they can be uh, static, which can lead to surprising behaviors during outages and, and also can be imprecise. But um, either way, you have this inherent problem that you will like to have some records at the very least that need to be accessed with leaders in different regions. And uh, if you don't, you're probably not utilizing the full capacity of your hardware either because uh, likely people in different regions are, are up and using the, the, uh, the systems at different times. Uh, and this can be compounded by the same client uh, problem. You could plausibly have client, a client in a different region to a leader uh, and also in a different region to another leader and, and end up with um, three round trips. At a minimum, I'm, I'm, I'm being very kind of assuming all of these, pro all these databases achieve one round trip uh, if everything's co-located. <clears throat> so, that's the state of the art uh, as it stands in industry today, to the best of my knowledge. Um, uh, there have been uh, developments in, the, in research uh, systems, and I'm going to uh, talk about one branch of these that I've uh, focused on in my proposal for the community. And that is uh, the leaderless uh, consensus protocols that derive from egalitarian Paxos. Um, now, the basic premise here is that there are no leaders. And as a result, um, any replica is able to simultaneously, alongside any other replica, coordinate uh, the agreement of a transaction with all of those other replicas at the same time. Um, now, the advantage of this is that not only do clients achieve uh, optimal latency because they can contact any replica and that replica can uh, go and speak to all of the other replicates, replicas immediately without any uh, one latency. Um, but uh, since it has been shown by more recent research that 
it is possible to, to uh, convert any of these uh, distributed consensus protocols into a multi-shard uh, consensus protocol. The same property applies for these distributed transactions, because any replica may contact the total set of all replicas for each of the shards that it needs to communicate with immediately from wherever it is. There's no worry about contacting the leader in one uh, region and the leader of another in another region. Um, and one really nice property of, of these uh, protocols is that they achieve uh, strict serializability, or they are they able to, uh, and they can do so with uh, strict guarantees about that. There's no uh, algorithmic concern about ever not being strict serializable. Um, additionally, as a small additional uh, uh, advantage, they don't suffer any abort problem, and so it is a uh, an operator or developer decision how um, how complex you allow your transactions to be with regards to uh, database uh, responsiveness, et cetera. So <clears throat> I'm going to briefly describe in one slide uh, how how these uh, protocols work in a, in a, at a broad sense. Um, and, and then I'm going to briefly discuss the three main uh, types of these protocols that have, have, have developed. So they, all of them uh, utilize, in essence, a two-round voting system. We have an, an initial round that uh, aims to reach a supermajority of, uh, of, the, of the nodes involved and, and hopes that they will unanimously agree on the execution order for the transaction. So each replica gets a vote on in what order a transaction should be executed. And if three quarters of the replicas, roughly, agree on that, on that decision, then the decision is taken immediately, the transaction executes straight away, and we've got a fast path decision in one round trip. If, for whatever reason, a supermajority either can't be reached because too many nodes are down, or they disagree on the execution order, then a, uh, a second round to a simple majority is able to make a decision so that a slow path decision usually takes two round trips. Some protocols, as we'll discuss, one protocol takes longer. So <clears throat> the original protocol, Egalitarian Paxos, um, decides this, uh, makes this decision using uh, what it calls dependencies. And this is just essentially all the transactions that conflict with the transaction that we're voting on uh, that, the, that a replica's seen before. Um, so if every uh, replica that's voting has seen the exact same preceding transactions, then they all agree that this transaction goes straight after them. Simple as that, really. And so here is an example. We have on the left, on the, the, with the red dots, we have transaction A. And on the right, we'll have what we call transaction B. And you can see they don't have the same uh, fast path uh, quorum. They, they've reached different nodes, although they overlap, of course. Now, if we overlay these, we can see that A obviously arrived first at all of the supermajority that it reached, and as a result, is able to take the fast path. But B has arrived uh, second on the uh, on six nodes, i.e., it sees a dependency of A on half of the on half of the voters, and a quarter of the voters see no dependency at all, see no pre pre preceding transaction, and as a result, it's it's not able to uh, take a fast path decision, and this property causes a high conflict rate in egalitarian Paxos. It, it essentially means that um, some subset of the voters have to see every transaction in exactly the same order without any disagreement um, for any period of, uh, of transaction execution. So more recently, a newer protocol has been uh, proposed called Caesar, which um, still derives dependencies like, like egalitarian Paxos, um, which I will gloss over for now, uh, but is important. Um, but primarily agrees a timestamp. So instead of uh, agreeing the uh, dependencies that have been seen beforehand, we instead simply say, is the timestamp I'm looking at as a voter, is it the most recent timestamp I've seen? And if it is, I'm going to say yes, that can execute uh, next. And so, sorry, I should have uh, clarified it. So we've got the same transactions, uh, sorry, same uh, quorums, but in this case, we're going to say there's a timestamp of zero uh, for the red. Uh, uh, dots of red voters, and a transaction timestamp of one for the blue uh, transactions. Now, if we overlay those, we'll see that with the same arrival order, um, the uh, zero transaction obviously arrived when there was no other transaction around, and so it executes and it's fine. But you'll notice that obviously the uh, transaction with the timestamp of one is the most recent at every uh, voter it arrives at, even though they see a different history. And this 
means that there's a lower conflict rate. However, it's uh, it's not a complete uh, um, a per a completely perfect situation. You can still have uh, transactions arrive in a different order. You'll see here. I'll just flick it back and forth. Now, so in this case, we've got half of the transactions arriving first on half of so half of the nodes witnessing uh, one arriving first, and half of them witnessing zero arriving first. And as a result, neither of the transactions can take the fast path. I'd like to clarify here that uh, egalitarian Paxos has this exact same problem. Uh, Caesar ha is, is strictly better from a conflict perspective, but, um, but it doesn't solve the problem completely. And additionally, Caesar has some really bad properties, or some undesirable properties, should we say. Um, it has uh, a worst case of, of three round trips, but, but importantly also doesn't guarantee that it will ever make a decision. In practice, it, it, it's unlikely to not reach a decision, but, um, but it might have some uh, spikes in, in latency in some rare circumstances. So finally, that brings us to uh, Tempo, the most recent protocol, um, and its predecessor Atlas by the same authors. This uh, essentially gets rid of the dependency decision, the dependency um, uh, assembling of Caesar that I glossed over. Um, but instead of uh, that, it, sorry, in, in its place, it manages to achieve the optimal latency we want of, of, of one round trip, always committing in, 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 in no more than two round trips. Um, but it, it, does, it does so at a cost of not being able to execute commutative operations concurrently. By this, we're talking again about that um, earlier optimization uh, I talked about with the existing Paxos implementation that allows reads to be uh, performed concurrently. So if you have several reads uh, that need to be performed, you can just run them at the same time. Tempo needs to run them serially. And this is a, a serious um, a penalty in my view because uh, expensive read operations are not uncommon in databases. And we need to really be able to scale up uh, that we don't want to have a bottleneck on a, on a single uh, partition that's highly contended uh, where every read having to be linearized on that on that operation. Uh, so that's all of the uh, the protocols uh, that are uh, uh, in the literature uh, today, in, broadly speaking, uh, in this category. And they all uh, have um, uh, some similar problems as well as those that I discussed for each of them. And the, the main one I want to highlight is uh, that this fast path um, is, is not very reliable. Um, you're, you want your cluster to uh, continue behaving uh, in a healthy and optimal manner, even under its worst case failure scenarios, ideally. So I, most clusters can tolerate just under a half of, fail, half of nodes failing. But the fast path in all of these protocols will uh, shut down when only a quarter of nodes uh, are failing. And this means that uh, you know, when you're having a bad time, you're having some kind of a major outage, suddenly your cluster is going to experience a slowdown and much higher load as all these additional messages need to be processed. And that's, uh, for me, a, a, a really worrisome uh, situation because it's very hard to really properly uh, um, ensure that your application is going to behave uh, adequately in these scenarios. Um, and additionally, unlike uh, leader-based approaches, at least in a single key case, uh, contended keys will reach agreement more slowly because you have this additional round trip, the second round trip. So the question is, can we do better than either of uh, these approaches? Neither of uh, neither the existing industry approaches nor the research approaches uh, have, I would say, optimal characteristics. And the answer is yes. Um, but before we get going, we might want to discuss what uh, ideal transactions might look like. And so I'm going to describe what I think they should look like. Um, and that is that I think strict serializability is non-negotiable. Um, it's very hard to be sure your applications are uh, behaving correctly, particularly when synchronizing external state with the database without strict serializability. I still think we should anyway have optimal latency. And by optimal, I mean we should be aiming for one round trip for the vast majority of operations in the database. I think we want to avoid the, uh, the failure uh, behaviors of uh, the fast paths of the existing um, protocols that I've just described. And, uh, and as a result, expect that uh, a database will behave as well as it can under the uh, maximal failure tolerance. And additionally, as a, I would say these are, these are nice to have, but, but the, the commutativity property of being able to parallelize reads is, is actually very important. And in an ideal world, aborts wouldn't be an, an inherent part of the transaction protocol. Uh, it would be nice to be able to perform transactions and know that they will succeed, regardless of their complexity. So 
we'll notice that uh, um, uh, I discussed um, CockroachDB, which uh, guarantees, guarantees only serializability, but gets strict serializability when the clocks are synchronized. Can we flip that guarantee? And can we get guarantee of strict serializability, but a guarantee of speed when the clocks are synchronized? But still fall back to this worst case two round trips if the, the clocks are unsynchronized and most operations still taking one round trip anyway. And uh, I'm going to show you how in, in, a, in a couple of slides. Uh, we initially start by uh, assuming that we have a timestamp protocol such as Caesar or Tempo. And then we're just going to briefly discuss the situation in which these protocols fail to reach um, uh, a fast path agreement. And this, here we have a, a heterogeneous network with one. Uh, uh, coordinator closer to a replica than another. And we're going to say that this further away replica starts a transaction at T0, and it travels halfway to the, uh, to the, re to the replica before uh, the nearer coordinator starts a later transaction and anyway arrives first. And at this point, this earlier transaction is going to be unable to at least get this fast path vote. So <clears throat> this problem can actually be solved quite simply, and that is by buffering the, uh, the messages on the voting replica to account for the difference in arrival time from different coordinators. So we know that another coordinator is further away, and so we can just buffer our messages for 20 milliseconds until any messages from that coordinator could have arrived. Um, furthermore, we can make this ironclad by accounting for clock skew. So if we know that the clocks are drifting by a few milliseconds, we can add an extra few milliseconds to allow older times uh, to, that, that, that could have been assigned from a, a clock that's drifted back in time to arrive as well. Um, and by doing this, if you will recall that timestamp protocols only require timestamps to arrive in timestamp order, if we can guarantee that we have all of these timestamps in our buffer and we process them in timestamp order, and consensus is guaranteed, we're going to get one round trip consensus every time. And importantly, if we're ever wrong about this, if we're wrong about the, the, the latency because something happens to the network, or we're wrong about um, the clock skew uh, because of some interruption, we don't have any correctness violation like some of the existing industry databases. And this also allows us to be very tight about our, uh, our expectations. We don't have to uh, have any padding here. We just, we just pick the correct amount of, of, of time and, and latency to account for. And, and if at any point we're wrong, we simply reconfigure. And so this is how it would work here. We have the same transaction T0 set off and halfway along T15 arrives, but the replica waits until sometime after T0 has arrived and everything's fine. So that's step one, but step two is deciding on the timestamp protocol. The ones that I proposed or discussed um, have suboptimal properties. Uh, we'd, we'd ideally use neither of these, except neither of these caveats. So briefly, very briefly, in, in, 30 seconds or so, introducing uh, Accord, uh, which is a new protocol that we have developed um, and published in a white paper that um, is able to achieve the uh, best characteristics of both of these protocols. So it is able to uh, guarantee the same latency characteristics of uh, Tempo, but still maintain uh, the uh, dependencies that Caesar uh, uh, assembles, and as a result is able to perform the commutative uh, uh, dependency resolution. Um, this is uh, achieved through a mix of a different way of uh, defining the dependency set and a, a different uh, mechanism of recovery. Um, but if you're interested, uh, come seek me out and have a chat. We may be organizing a Q&A, an extended Q&A, to discuss this next week, in fact. So you can s see about that on the dev list or the uh, SF Slack. Um, or look at the white paper. Um, <clears throat> so that was, that was actually pretty easy, right? We've got now strict serializability optimal latency, and these other two additional properties we might like. But what about our failure properties? So for this last piece of the puzzle, we want to unpack why our fast paths are so big. And it all comes down to failure. Let's take these two uh, uh, same fast paths that we've been using until now, and imagine that one or both of them has failed. Now, bear in mind, these could have already answered to the clients in one round trip, and a necessary part of it being one round trip decision is that you can't really know what it's told the client or not, because it hasn't necessarily recorded it in the database before responding. So we, if they have failed, we have this thing called a recovery quorum, which is a simple majority, 
And we need it to be able to assemble what could have happened. So any, any transactions that did take the fast path, we need this recovery quorum to be able to figure out that they definitely did, or at least that they, if they didn't, we can treat them as though they did safely. And the way that happens is simply by saying that the intersection of any two fast path quorums with a recovery quorum must witness, the, so, sorry, must overlap uh, at at least one node. And that, that's really the same as saying that the recovery quorum must always witness one of these transactions as having witnessed the other transaction. And so if it, if it, if it knows that that's occurred, then it knows that they will have ordered themselves correctly with respect to each other. And we can see here that that's basically where this three quarters come, comes from. This overlaps, this recovery quorum, at just one node. So can we use this information to reduce the size of these quorums? And, and, and the answer is yes. We can do that by excluding replicas from the voting set for fast path quorums. So if we wanted to remove, say, two nodes from the uh, fast path electorate, I call it, those that are eligible to vote, you can see that the size of the quorum reduces by one. <clears throat> uh, and this approach can be extended to essentially account for any number of failures. So when these uh, when nodes fail, we remove them from the electorate. And I'm oh, sorry, I should show you that this still overlays, overlays overlaps at, at one uh, healthy node. But uh, as I was saying, we can take this all the way to maximal failure. If we remove all of the failed nodes from the electorate, we're left with essentially a simple quorum that will always overlap with a recovery quorum as well. And at this point, we are always contacting the same set of nodes for every fast path decision, but that's fine because we're at maximal failure tolerance. These nodes all have to be healthy and responding, otherwise the, the cluster's uh, keeled over already. And so we're able now to achieve fast path decisions without, uh, under any uh, amount of failure. And we have now achieved our ideal transactions. This work is uh, coming to Cassandra next year, I hope. Uh, it's still under discussion on the uh, Cassandra Dev mailing list. And when it lands, will be the first uh, scalable database that guarantees strict serializable isolation on commodity hardware. Um, I think second only at all to, uh, to Spanner and maybe some two-phase commit protocols. Um, and the first to offer optimal commit latency in all regions, the first full stop, I think, to offer optimal latency to all clients in all regions. And, and I think also the first petabyte scale database with uh, multi-region, true multi-region transactions that are global. And uh, the prototype has been published to my GitHub uh, and the white paper has been published as I've discussed. And there's an extensive discussion about this on the Cassandra Dev mailing list. Um, Thank you for your time. I hope you uh, could follow along with all that. I know it was a lot to cover, um, and I've used the entire time budget. I've got 30 seconds or so for uh, questions. Um, uh, but we will be running an extended Q&A, uh, as I um, discussed before. So do we have any questions? Or I mean, I don't know if we're going to get booted even in like 30 seconds. So. Pleasure. <clears throat> uh, maybe, Joey. I mean, ask me some questions, and we'll, we'll I'll answer them until we get booted. Uh, yes, let me see if I... Oh, cool. Okay, great. That's good. That's good news. Uh, okay, so I'll, I won't full screen it or anything. What, you want to do the, uh, the quorums involved in cross-region. Which part are you talking about there, uh, Joey? Do you mean the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, leader, the leaderless protocols of consensus or the, um, the leader-based um, uh, cross cross WAN issues. Um, sure. Uh, what, what do you want to uh, discuss about that? So I guess I didn't actually go into too much detail about how, yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> um, so I didn't go into too much detail about how the cross uh, region or um, cross shard either uh, aspect of, of it works. But the um, when it comes to cross region, uh, 
aspect of, of these leaderless protocols. Essentially, uh, the it's, it's just like any normal quorum, essentially. Every every single um, uh, node in any region can be a, can be a, a, a voter in, in a decision. Um, obviously, the... Uh, I'm not sure what to say, not sure what to, uh, say besides that, to be honest. Actually, um, does that? I mean, does that make sense? Uh, that, uh, so it's it's just like you know, like any other quorum. Every everyone is a voter, um, essentially, in in all regions, and and whoever you get responses from, um, uh, you're able to make a decision uh, as you would with a you know with a with a normal quorum. The quorums are slightly larger than um, uh, with a simple majority quorum, unless you bias towards a couple of data centers. So this is something that. I could see occurring um, depending on your replication factor, etc. Um, yes, the quorums definitely have to overlap. Um, uh, so, well, so no, so uh, essentially, so it depends on the replication factor, right? So, and there's a bunch of complexity here. So, the the the, the definition of the size of the uh, fast path electorate when every node is a potential voter is uh, seal three f plus one, three f over two plus one. Sorry. Um, so uh, it's the so essentially in a in a in a, in a nine node cluster it's seven nodes. Um, so if you have say three replicas in three data centers, then in this case you would have to have all three data centers respond. Um, but uh, because this fast path electorate can be modified, you can exclude one or two nodes from these and reduce that to six or five as necessary. But this would necessarily bias. The, uh, the the ability to make fast path decisions to only two of the data centers, so that the third data center would have to um, ask one of the, the, these two other data centers to, to, to reach a fast path decision. Um, there are ways to uh, avoid this, but unfortunately, they um, involve uh, significant complexity and worse uh, a number of other worse properties. So there's a particular optimization for EPAXOS that allows you to reduce the size of your uh, fast path quorum by one by uh, requiring that the coordinator is a replica. The problem with that is that with multi-shard transactions, uh, you can't really guarantee that um, your coordinator is a replica. So you start having to do things like proxy your vote through another replica on each shard. And then to ensure that you handle failure, you start having to send redundant messages to ensure that you can, uh, you're can you not exposed to lots of extra failures. Um, I can imagine a, 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 um, a mode of operation. I've been thinking about this today, a mode of operation um, for a chord, which is Kelvin-like um, or a fauna-like, uh, should we say, where the consensus is done by a um, a single shard for small enough clusters to tolerate it. And in this case, you could quite easily apply this optimization, and so you'd have maybe um, uh, you'd only need an, uh, uh, need to say if you had uh, three copies uh, um, in each. Uh, I think you just get down to six with uh, epaxis in the case of nine. Um, if you had uh, uh, three replicas in three data centers, you could get away with um, six votes from any of the data centers, um, but but you'd be constrained on the size of the cost that you could you could you could um, uh, manage in in that respect. So I think this would be like a later optimization uh, kind of piece of work. If that does that make sense? It was very deep there. I guess actually, with kind of assumes a lot of context potentially. So I'm doing my best here. <clears throat> any other questions? Uh, good question, Anthony. Um, so, eight data centers with different replication factors are, are not a problem at all. I mean, as I say, they're they're essentially. So, it's actually um, there, there's a whole rabbit hole to go down here because uh, uh, obviously you can always define the equivalence of quorums of quorums and each quorums and things like that. Um, but I don't think that's very helpful here necessarily. Um, but uh, but assuming we're talking about simple, essentially just defining them all as a kind of like a you know a, a collective uh, for reaching decisions, there's. There's no problem with them having different replication factors in different data centers. They'll just be different uh, numbers of voters in each data center. So you could easily have, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, and in fact, I've been considering uh, this kind of situation of some kind of arbiter data center and just two cop two data centers, so that you can reduce the number of copies or the number of major large regions you need. Um, and in this case, you could, you know, you could potentially have like, you know, a smaller data center with maybe even just a single replica, uh, or not even replica, like single kind of arbiter. Uh, process um, and uh, in normal operation, these other two data centers would just uh, communicate with each other to make decisions. But if one of them failed, the arbiter data center could um, involve itself to to um, uh, change the fast path to, uh, to 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 involve only itself and the other data center. Um, but I mean, we're getting way ahead of ourselves again there into like kind of uh, uh, 
um, future optimizations. Uh, the reality is it's it's you know like it would be in, in any other quorum basically having different replication factors. You just do the maths to to account for the different replication factors. Does that answer the question? Oh, I, I was just, I, I, yeah, OK. Uh, I'll keep the, right. Uh, I don't actually quite understand the question. The shards are distinct replication sets. Um, I mean, if that's just a query, you're just confirming that is the case, then, then yes, essentially. Well, in the case of shards, I'm essentially referring to a token range um, in Cassandra, although I'm hoping that we'll get rid of the concept of a token range in the, uh, in the, in the near future as part of work that some colleagues of mine will be proposing in the near future, because it's a mess, token ranges. They don't make any sense. Um, but yeah, basically, that's what we're talking about. <clears throat> I'll give everyone a minute or so to finish typing if they've got any questions, and then and then I'll let everyone leave. Yes, uh, the question, uh, Joey, if you, if for everyone, if you haven't seen Joey's question, is do you think this protocol paves the path towards secondary indices? And and yes, uh, I. I personally uh, think that uh, probably one of the first um, uh, extensions to this work I would want to pursue is secondary indices, uh, secondary indexes, because I think it's uh, it's a sore lacking in Cassandra, and um, the the uh, the difficulty of producing them with this uh, is is dramatically reduced. We just need to create um, uh, essentially uh, uh, reconnaissance rounds like a la Calvin to to be able to perform um, optimistic uh, transactions on uh, the data in the secondary index as well as in the uh, the primary index. Um, so it's, yeah, uh, I, I currently uh, expect that we will we will implement that and in, in follow up to this work, assuming the community agrees uh, for the work to go ahead. Ah, so this is a good question. How, how would non-transactional reads work? Um, so this is uh, a whole kind of deep optimization problem that uh, probably hasn't been considered uh, extensively. So, um, and there's a bunch of possible different levels of 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 uh, of um, non-transactional, less transactional reads. So um, it's worth noting that. The transactional reads are anyway going to be very fast here, right? They're going to be basically as fast as um, uh, as, as normal reads are today, um, because they uh, they only need to go over the network once. In fact, uh, when it comes to reads, we don't ever um, need to go twice um, over the network, uh, so they're guaranteed one round trip. Um, so it may be the case that everyone prefers to just use strict serializable reads. Um, we might be able to start offering um, other various kinds of um, reasonably uh, uh, accurate local reads, um, DC local reads. Um, because we're replicating uh, the uh, transaction log in inverted commas uh, um, serially to each replica, um, it, is, um, it, it, is, it is plausible, it is likely that we can deliver, say, for instance, serializable uh, transactions that don't need to go over the, uh, over the wide area network. But there would be some complexity to doing that, so I don't think that's going to be delivered immediately. Um, but then we can also just offer just, you know, um, especially on a single key case, like in a kind of like the eventually consistent case, you can just hit every uh, replica and you will get a, uh, a valid kind of uh, data point that is just maybe potentially stale. And, and then we might just be talking about introducing concepts of bounded staleness. There's all kinds of things we can do potentially here that aren't necessarily even very difficult because we have a, a, a consistent view, like a, for at least on a per key basis, every replica will be uh, exposing a serializable view of the data uh, that's valid. Um, and uh, and and so yeah, there's a bunch of things uh, that can that can be thought of there. Um, 
if that makes sense. I should also mention here, actually, the reads are going to become a lot more efficient because um, only one uh, replica is ever going to be need to be involved in answering a read. We have to um, the uh, there's going to be a, a consensus round if you need uh, strict serializability and some other kind of work to to ensure serializability in multi key case sense things like this. And if we do snapshot isolation, that's uh, they're going to be in a whole other like uh, piece of work. But um, but uh, because the, uh, the a given replica will 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 be essentially informed of what it should have witnessed before it can answer a read, and it will just make sure that it's witnessed that before answering the read. And so there won't be you know the assembly of, of, of multiple different uh, bits of data from multiple uh, nodes. They won't, the the I.O. will go down by, by a, a factor of RF over two. So you'll only be yeah, hearing from uh, one replica. So you should, should see the load on the cluster go down as a result of running these transactions. Uh, so uh, great question, uh, Anthony. So the, uh, the, this, uh, this work is, is still in a prototype sense, so we haven't seen uh, any issues uh, um, of like this at all. However, I'm, uh, I, I anticipate the the time uh, buffer for for this to be uh, somewhat automatically determined, uh, maybe even by simply uh, asking NTPD um, or having uh, some kind of distributed, uh, like eventually consistent uh, di di like dissemination of um, NTPD's information about clock drift in the cluster, um, and uh, and and also. Um, Link latencies, um, with the option of just hard coding them, of course. Um, but you don't want them to be huge, right? Because um, if they're a significant portion of just the extra round trip time, you might as well just let the protocol do its normal thing of mostly getting one round trips and occasionally taking two round trips. And um, the only value of of doing this buffering is when you can expect it to be very small. And I'm actually expecting that in in um, uh, most clusters, uh, the the clock drift uh, uh, component should be very small, like a few milliseconds, and then you'll only be accounting for the difference in link latencies, which anyway isn't actually slowing down the transaction because the coordinators got to wait for that time to elapse from the other answers. Um, so uh, it's going to be, yeah, I, I hope this will be pretty much automatic and um, and and uh, with just some ability to override it. Does that make sense? Pleasure. Um, give uh, Anthony or whoever else another one, another minute or so to type out another question, then we'll call it a day. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to listen to that. I know it was uh, quite dense, uh, so I'm glad you all stuck around and, and actually paid attention. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, well, we're hopefully going to arrange a uh, like a face-to-face Q&A, uh, which would be much better anyway for this. You're right, this is a bit silly sitting here waiting for a minute for everyone to catch up. <laughs> and it's a bit weird, honestly, typing, sorry, speaking to uh, just myself. Um, so uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully speaking with everyone who's interested. Um, maybe next week sometime, we'll see. Great, thanks, everybody. And um, catch you, uh, you know, in Slack and uh, at, at the Q&A and everything. Cheers. Yeah.